right. So uh, my guest this week is Divya Mudappa, who is a restorer of forests and a researcher in the Valpare Plateau of Tamil Nadu. She and her husband, Tia Shankaraman, painstakingly germinate seeds of native tree species in a nursery and transplant them into plots slated for restoration and collaboration with agro companies. But Divya studied the brown palm civet for her PhD and continues to work on small mammals such as otters. Welcome to Wild Women Interviews, Divya. Hi, Janaki. Thank you. Let me start by asking you, where would you most like to live? I know you live in Valparai, which is very beautiful and scenic, but what is your dream? Where, where's your dream destination? I don't know. Sometimes I think of New Zealand, but I think I'm quite happy to be in Valparais and I think I'm very fortunate to be here. <laughs> okay, I would like to ask you why New Zealand, but I don't ask questions about these questions. So I'm just <laughs> What are you doing now? Uh, I read multiple books at a time, but currently I'm reading A Short Philosophy of Birds. Philosophy uh, by, by Philip, yeah, a short philosophy of birds. That's it's uh, it, it's a very interesting book. It has short essays where it talks about migratory birds and how humans connect with them, or you know what aspects of migration is there in human whatever uh, behavior. Wow, yeah, so it's quite interesting. I'm reading Lab Girl after many years oh, of nice. publication. Have you read it? No, I've read parts of it. We have the book. I haven't read it completely. Yeah it's, yeah, it's very interesting the way she writes about, you know, she talks about trees and how they survive and then cuts to her memoir. It's very interesting. Yeah. I'm enjoying it. What's yeah. your guiltiest pleasure? Traveling. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes, I love to travel, but I also think of climate change because the places I like to travel to, I have to fly back and forth, carbon footprint. So yeah, I feel guilty about it. You don't think you've offset it with all the trees that you've been planting? Yeah, but that's a very <laughs> narrow way of looking at it because I, yeah, that's how I justify it with my friends and some people who try to make me feel even more guilty, but yeah. Yeah, I've yeah, I've done a lot of restoration, but I don't think that justifies how I live my life sometimes. So uh, you started, uh, to, you st studied brown palm civet. It's not really charismatic. It's not this glamorous big mammal. So how did you come to study that? I think uh, that's something that I chose to. It seems like, you know, like when you have to start a research, you'll have to either find a topic or a subject that has not been studied before. And just like you mentioned, they're not glamorous. So I land up studying these species which are not glamorous or tough to study. Or, <laughs> you know, like I studied Malabar Grey Hornbill, which nobody had studied because it's small, gray. You know, it's even called Shola Kaka, which is a forest crow. So nobody had studied it. So I studied that and then I moved on to brown palm civet. It's tough to study there and um, you get very little data. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, so it was interesting. And I, I, uh, I was very comfortable studying at night, uh, being out in the forest and doing research at night. So I think uh, it worked out for me. Okay. So why was it difficult to study? And how were you in the forest in the middle of the night? I mean, I would imagine lots of women would say that is just not the thing they would do. Uh, so why, why is it difficult to study? It is difficult to study because they're nocturnal or uh, they're cryptic, like uh, you very rarely see them and even because they're nocturnal and if you're doing spotlighting, you only see eye shines most often. They live in rainforest. So they are foraging up in the trees, eating fruits or whatever, and you barely get to see them. 
So then what is it that you can study and how it how can they be studied becomes a challenge. Unfortunately, I had the support of Wildlife Institute of India and I could carry out the uh, radio covering study of brown palm civet. Uh, that's how I managed to get some, you know, uh, uh, understanding of some aspects of their ecology. Otherwise, it would have been very difficult. You hardly ever get to see them. And why would you study them? Huh. So again, you know, uh, small carnivores, they are very diverse. So you, you have a lot of species and very often in one area, you have uh, many different species living together. And then my idea was to understand how different they are from each other that they can coexist within a small, uh, within the same habitat type. And uh, later, once I started studying the brown palm civet, I realized that they are very good dispersers as well. And um, most palm civets eat a lot of fruits. And, uh, and that's again, one of my, one of the subjects that I was interested in, frugivory and seed dispersal. Since I had studied hornbills, I was also looking at forest, interested in forest dynamics. So I started seeing civets as a, playing a very important role in dispersal of trees. The forest. So, yeah. Since you kind finished your combined a few different interests of mine. Sorry. Since you finished your PhD. Go ahead. You... Sorry. Since you finished your PhD, you've moved on to working with the restoration of forest fragments. Why? What led to that change? So interestingly, uh, like I just mentioned, civets. Uh, I recorded civets eating a lot of fruits. Uh, and as part of my study, I started germinating them. And uh, what we have been always taught is that rainforest trees are difficult to grow and they may not germinate. You know, we don't understand their ecology. But when I landed up with a lot of seedlings, I did not know what to do with them. So uh, we were looking for places to plant them out in. Uh, I was studying in KMTR where there were some abandoned cardamom plantations. And during our studies, we had realized that the regeneration was quite poor, even within these cardamom plantations, which had been, say, uh, abandoned for five to 10 years. So we decided to plant them out there. And they did quite well. And uh, as part of my study, I was also looking at the effect of fragmentation on small carnivores. And so I came to the anomalies where we have smaller patches of forest and most of them quite degraded. That's when we realized that there's an opportunity to restore them. And I think seeing that a lot of seeds from civet scats were germinating well, we thought it is probably possible to germinate seeds from seeds of rainforest trees as well and try to put them out. Yeah, that was the, I think, uh, inspiration of sorts. So why, I mean, from what you said, the civets seem to be very good at doing the job of restoring forest fragments. So why do you have to go in and, you know, help them? So uh, lots, lots of these fragments are quite isolated. And I think the the plants that regenerate within them are species where there are some other trees. So the tree densities themselves are much lower in forest fragments. And the densities of carnivores or all, uh, even palm civets are much lower within these forest fragments. So there is a limitation to how much they would be bringing in or dispersing. And uh, so when we uh, carried out studies, we realized that many species were absent within these fra forest fragments or although they were they occurred in the larger landscape and uh, also a few of our studies showed that if the say the structure of the forest fragment was good or better they tended to hold much more uh, complete communities of say even birds or other mammals so it's not just the degradation, uh, it's, it's not just the size of the fragment that mattered, but the quality of the fragment that would matter. 
in the long term to uh, conserve the say subsets of better communities of uh, different species. So we thought, although these fragments exist, if they existed in better condition, they will probably support many more species than they are doing currently. So the most uh, endangered- I don't know, did it answer my, uh, did yeah, it answer your it, question? I mean, it's so related. I didn't expect it to have such a cl close relationship to each other. Um, so perhaps the most endangered species of uh, small mammal carnivore and almost extinct is the Malabar civet. When did you first mm -hmm. hear about it? Oh, I heard about it just when I started my career in wildlife research, uh, when I was doing my master's uh, work in Topslip. And uh, I was out one night and I saw a, a uh, civet. I knew it was a civet. I knew it was a terrestrial civet and I knew it was black and white in color. It had bands on the tail. And then I realized it was small Indian civet. Then a few days later, once again in the night, I saw another rat creature which looked quite similar, but I felt it was larger. And when I mentioned, I came back to the to my house that I was looking at Mammals of India Prater, Prater's book. And then I realized there's something called Malabar civet. And it said it looks very similar to small Indian civet, but it's larger. So then I immediately wrote to Ajit Kumar, Dr. Ajit Kumar, who was in SACON then. And then he got really excited. And that's when I got to know and learn about Malabar civet. Otherwise, I didn't even know of its existence. And um, then he and Ashraf came over and we set up camera traps. We got small Indian civet. We did not get the Malabar civet. Right. What does the Malabar civet look like? Hmm. So I don't know how many people are familiar with small Indian civet. Do you um, want to share but, the uh, it, image that compares? Yes, but this, the, I don't have a small Indian image with me right now. Oh, I see. A small Indian civet image. It's uh, I've got uh, yeah, but should I find it for you? Uh, okay, never mind. I should. Should I? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, small Indian civet is a uh, is a uh, say a uh, twice the size of a cat, a normal uh, normal cat, not some of those large ones. And it is uh, mostly white with black spots and some black lines on it with bands on the tail. And the Malabar civet apparently is about a third larger than the small Indian civet and more dog-like in its looks with, with a much more uh, pronounced uh, muzzle and also very strong barring uh, black and white stripes uh, along the throat. And, uh, but at a glance, they're easily mistakable. Not that I've seen a Malabar civet, but I think they can be easily mistaken for one another, yeah. So how have uh, these descriptions come to us? Are they from specimens? Do photographs exist of the Malabar civet? So, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if you've read, uh, I know that you've written a couple of articles about Malabar civet. Uh, so basically, it uh, nobody has seen a Malabar civet in the wild. And the Malabar civet that we hoped to have in, in southern India, particularly in Kerala, were all uh, recorded as specimen, mostly skin. A couple of them were stuffed specimen. And uh, nobody has seen them in the wild, ever. I mean, even the collectors who had these skins and who have contributed them to various museums, uh, Natural History Museum London, um, BNHS, uh, ZSI uh, in India, uh, in Calcutta and Calicut, none of them were collected by the people who have deposited them. 
So we really have no idea what the species is looks like in the wild, but there, there are similar species. So there is a large spotted species, which is in Southeast Asia. And uh, earlier, the Malabar civet was considered a subspecies of the last spotted civet. Uh, and then there is the large Indian civet, which is from North, which in within India, you find in Northeast India. And there is a Malay civet, which you find in the Malay Peninsula and in the islands uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, but the most closely related one to Malabar civet is the large spotted civet. But the two civets, the large spotted civet and the Malabar civet don't occur in the same area as far as we know, right? No, no, they, they do not overlap at all. They're two disjunct populations. Whereas the large spotted civet overlaps in some areas with large Indian civet as well as Malay civet. Okay. So when you say these um, collectors who donated these specimens to museums didn't, uh, hadn't seen the animals in the wild, where did they get the specimens from, the skins and the stuffed specimens? So as you may be aware, uh, you know, when we were a British colony, people were collecting animals from across the world and classifying them. And it so happens that India, particularly Calcutta, was a hub for this kind of trade and transport of specimens from across South and Southeast Asia. So the, the earliest specimen, which, which is apparently still in India now with ZSI Calcutta holotype, which none of us have seen. Uh, it was collected or rather gifted to ZSI in 1845. And the person who gifted it is also a collector. So he's been, he had been collecting from again, all across South and Southeast Asia. And when uh, Blythe, who was then the curator, collected the specimen, he said, ha, huh, this looks like whatever. Uh, it's apparently from Southern India. That's what it said. And uh, nobody really knows where it came from. And uh, if you go back to the person who gifted to it, he says that he bought it from somebody else who had bought it from someone else. So we really don't know the origin of that specimen, which we call the holotype. And another one, again, an older specimen, which is in Natural History Museum London, uh, was gifted by Raffles in 1838, I think. Uh, it was sent to London. And uh, the funny thing is that Raffles almost never worked in India. Yeah. He probably visited India. He's mostly in Southeast Asia. And he himself bought that specimen from somewhere. And the label says Sumatra. And later on, people who have looked at it have reclassified it as Malabar civet, probably from South India. So the provenance of the six skin specimens that one can potentially go and examine is not there at all. We really have no idea where they originated from. So just a follow-up question. Why is it that you weren't able to see the holotype at ZSI? Calcutta? Uh, they said the skin is in very poor condition and they will not allow examination of it. So, uh, and of course, during our project, we didn't have too much uh, ability to follow up with permits, etc. And But they did let us examine two other specimens, which have been either identified as the Malabar civet or the large spotted civet or a subspecies of large spotted civet. So if you look at the tag, there are all the three names. So you have no idea what it is. So that's, but uh, some of the historical, uh, there's this uh, person called Lindsay who examined these skins and she classified them as large spotted civet. So do we know how the Malabar civet is distinct from the large spotted civet? Apparently a uh, skeletal characteristic, which 
however it it's called coronoid uh, uh, it, it, it it's a part of the skull uh, and the mandible which is different apparently and that's the only consistent difference between malabar civet and this uh, last spotted civet but the people who have examined all these skins and skins of the other vivera have generally said that the intraspecies difference or the variation within species is so large that the the differences between these species these two species is very you know can fall within that range so it is really not clear even they were not very clear so you mean to say that there is such a wide variety within a species that you can't tell the differences between two different species that's right yeah so if uh, the only distinct character is a mandible and you have to check a skeletal specimen for it is there any way that you can see the animal and say it's a large spotted or malabar <laughs> i mean without having to kill it and skeletonize it <laughs> No, if, if there was a Malabar uh, large spotted civet released in here in my field site, and if I see it, I wouldn't be able to say that large spotted. I would assume it's a Malabar civet because it is here. Right? So it's, it's just because of the geographies, we would assume that it is a different species because this species has been recorded at uh, and expect it to occur here. Otherwise, no. Right. So Maybe I was I can know. looking at um, the field guide to the mammals of India by Vivek Menon, and he talks about this crest mm -hmm. from the back of mm -hmm. the Malabar civet, and it goes down all the way to the tail. So is that something yeah. that Typical can be tail. used as a character to differentiate between the two species between the malabar civet and the large spotted yeah no 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 all the viveras have the uh, the crest going right to the tip of the tail really? whereas you can tell you can tell the malabar civet from small indian civet because the civet bands are complete whereas the malabar civet has that line on the top of the tail yeah right so what I mean, I can, I know that the species has been described forever. It's in Prater's book from what the 19, published in the 1960s or 35. even earlier? 35. Yeah, 65, yeah. So in that yeah, yeah. he's talking about Malabar civet being a coastal species. Whereas then Angus Hutton, who was a tea planter said, there were lots of them in Megamalai, for instance. So what do you make of these, uh, the habitat that this species supposedly occupies? So among all these people, the only person who, has, who was kind of posted or traveled across many parts of India is Jordan. He was there for some time in Kerala, then he was there in Northern Karnataka as well. And it seems to me that he was the first person who said that Malabar civets are common, they can be found in the coastal plains, also in the in the mountainous areas, and maybe they can occur in Kurg and Vainad as well. So, but if you look at any of his writings, he also mentions that he's never seen a Malabar civet himself, but he believes that they are common. Why? And uh, no idea, really no idea. And uh, yeah, because then he says even small Indian civet is common. And he also says in one part when uh, he was trying to help somebody collect some specimen, people sent him what they called was Malabar civet. Later they turned, those skins are available and they turned out to be small Indian civets. So Pocock, who revised all these classifications of the Indian mammals, clearly says Jordan was probably mistaken in, in, the, in the first place, thinking that Malabar civet is a common species. 
So then what does Poco go on to say? <laughs> He he's examined these skins and said he's like, you know, whatever, vacillated between it being a Malabar civet or a subspecies of large Indian, uh, large spotted civet. So, and they're very very closely related. And okay, so <laughs> have I confused you enough? Yeah. So the other confounding factor in this whole scene is the trade in civets, right? And from very ancient mm -hmm. times until recently, there was a very strong trade between Africa and India and Southeast Asia and India for large bodied civets for the musk they produce. Yeah. So is it, how does the yeah. trade, that history of trade um, play a role in the Malabar civets. So uh, I, uh, you may be aware that you know uh, Malabar civet after these initial descriptions were never seen, and even then they were never seen in the wild. And finally, uh, in late eighties, people were started doing uh, you know surveys, field surveys to find the species, and it was rediscovered in nineteen eighty seven with three specimens found by ZSI uh, uh, Cori Code, uh, Dr. Kurup. And two of those skins are available now. One with ZSI, the other one uh, with Calicut University. But the interesting thing is that they do not, they say that they got report of three civets, uh, which seem to be Mal fit the description of Malabar civet. But by the time they went there, they were dead. So we do not know whether they were caught from the wild or they died in captivity, right? And uh, then again, after that, there was a spate of uh, surveys by Dr. Ajit Kumar and his team, Ashraf and Nitin Rai. And uh, Ashraf also discovered two skins in, in the same site where Dr. Kurup had discovered them. So they all seem to be within a very, very small geographic area around Calicut, Kohikot, where which used to be and still is the hub of the trade. It, it's one of the major ports into which there was lots of international trade coming in. And it's also the hub of Ayurvedic centers. And the civet is mostly used in Ayurvedic, you know, treatments or medicines, yeah. So we have no, we haven't been able to find any direct uh, documentation of large spotted civets coming into India. Uh, however, there, there are reports of the African civet from which civet is collected generally to have been brought into India before. And there is a specimen of an African civet, which is in a museum in Europe, which says Vivera civeta, but South India. But if you look at the specimen, it is clearly an African civet. So it has been named wrongly as Malabar civet because it, the skin has gone from India. Uh, similarly, if you look at a couple of skins, I will uh, show you the picture shortly that went from Trivandrum Zoo, one which is with BNHS currently, the other one, sorry, that's fine. Uh, uh, the other one is in uh, 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 Natural History Museum. They were of two civets, uh, which were in the Trivandrum Zoo, which died and the, and the skins were sent to these two places. But Trivandrum Zoo never maintained a record of where the animals came from, but it was a private collection of the king. And so animals were there from all over the place. There were giraffes as well, or, or hippopotamus and things like that. So animals could have come from anywhere. Okay, so <laughs> is it possible that the Malabar civet was so sought after in the trade that they were pretty wiped out by collectors hunting them to sell to traders for the civetones? 
I really doubted the, uh, I mean, uh, yes, hunting could drive some species close to extinction or extinction itself. But if you look at any small carnivore across the world, we have about 165 species and a lot of them are you know, quite severely hunted, even otters for that matter, but none of them have really gone extinct. And they're very adaptable. They are, uh, uh, you know, they live in different kinds of habitats. Very few of them, uh, hardly any of them are habitat specialists or, uh, you know, they're really not a specialist group, right? I mean, there are otters, there are many kinds of otters which use rivers and lakes, etc. But then they have adapted. They are even now found in highly modified habitats. They're found in rivers which from perennial have become seasonal, but they use those things seasonally. So it's very unlikely that hunting would have driven this to extinction unless it was intrinsically rare. But on the other hand, if it is intrinsically rare, I think hunters also would have found it extremely tough to find them. And small Indian civets, even now, are in farms, even in Kerala. And the farms are mostly replenished from the wild, even now, because they don't breed very well in captivity. So if the small Indian civet has not been driven, I mean, it's still quite common, it's very unlikely that hunting for uh, extraction of civet alone would have caused this extinction of the species. Really, I mean, it seems quite uh, <laughs> improbable. So as an expert on small mammals, what do all these little nuggets of information lead you to surmise the fact that it's a, it belongs to a family of extremely adaptable creatures possibly no specialized habitat, no specialized diet, probably not tar targeted by hunters, but even if they were, couldn't have driven them to extinction. The few skins in museums and this confusion about where these skins came from, what does it all tell you? What, what do we draw? What conclusion can we draw from it? So while doing you know, while it, I thought about this for nearly 15 years, right? I mean, even I wanted to see a Malabar civet. I was looking for it. I was planning surveys of the species. And, uh, and also it was a time when lots of surveys for different groups of animals was happening right across Western Ghats. And many of, uh, not many of us, Nandini and I, both of us who are, uh, you know, studying nocturnal mammals, we were really actively looking for the species. And when we did find it, we, I think it kind of started to dawn upon us that it may not even exist. It's probably a medical creature in the sense that it's not a valid taxon. Uh, and even assuming that you have found a few skins in the uh, whatever from like the more recent skins that were found, we know that they were picked up from Kerala. And also looking at how small that geographic range is, it makes me believe that it must have been in trade, it must have been in captivity. And interestingly, even for some of the older skins, Pocock and, uh, and uh, Lindsay, they say that looking at the specimens, it is quite clear that they have been in captivity at some point in their life. So I, and, and you know, like you were talking about hunting, like if you look at large spotted civet, they occur in Southeast Asia where the intensity of hunting is like way above what it is in India, right? And uh, they are also a lowland evergreen forest species. And most of the lowland evergreen forests are, have disappeared, logging and conversion to you know paddy fields, etc. But you still do find large spotted civets there. So if you can find large spotted civet in an area which is so modified and so extensively hunted, I I can't believe that you know in India we could have driven a species to extinction by the kind of collections that happen here. Very unlikely. And so it it makes me believe very strongly that this is not a valid species. 
Okay, so with all these uh, specimens in museums, including the recent ones that Dr. Kurup and Ashraf have found, wouldn't you be able to settle the issue by looking at the DNA? So that's also something we tried. Uh, but the skins, the, the specimens have been preserved so badly that we've not been able to extract meaningful amounts of DNA from them. And uh, it's quite sad because yes, uh, in fact, we think that should be the first step to resolving whether this is a valid species at all or not. But even the specimens that are in say Natural History Museum or or ZSIs or BNHs, none of them are in a good enough shape to extract DNA from, most likely because it's been handled, it's been, you know, preserved not very well. It was preserved locally and not really curated by a museum as a specimen to last. So, yeah, but I, I do hope that, you know, somebody comes up with, uh, you know, uh, laboratory methods which can uh, resolve this once and for all because it is the only critically endangered small carnivore in the world and so there is a, there are a lot of conservation agencies and conservation funding which is looking at doing studies about the species trying to revive it even through captive breeding but the question is where you're going to get the animals for captive breeding from right we don't even no, nobody has ever seen it and also in more recent times, as you, you're well aware, there is a lot of camera trapping surveys going on across this range, you know, either in tiger reserves or by other research groups, et cetera. And nobody has ever recorded it. Uh, and uh, it's it's just, I don't know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a big question mark. <laughs> So then what, what about all these distinct features that are set to set the Malabar civet apart from the large spotted civet or the large Indian civet, like this crest and the complete... No, 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 no. What about that? No, no, it is not very different from the large spotted civet. Right? I, I, it's just one uh, uh, skeletal difference, a small skeletal difference, but that also most of the other experts who study museum specimens have said could be a variation within the species itself. Also sometimes that it's because it's in, a, in the mandible, right? And so if it is a captive animal, if that difference also could arise because if, if it's an animal which has been in captivity, the kind of diet it, it's fed, etc., could result in that change. So it's no nobody has ever said that it is distinctly different from the large sports event. Wow. So if <laughs> it doesn't exist, I mean, what does it take to take it away from the list of Indian fauna? Like, are we going to keep repeating there is this species that is near extinction or is in danger of extinction and it looks like this and it's found here. Are we going to keep perpetrating that myth? I don't think so. I think the, the small carnivore specialist group are at a stage where they really want to give it one last shot, right? Uh, usually if a species has not been seen for about three decades in the wild, it is uh, declared as being extinct from the wild. Right, but in our case, it's not there in captivity as well. So therefore, it will be declared extinct. So before the next, in the next two to two to three years, or maybe a little longer, uh, the group of people within the small carnivore specialist group want to give it a final shot, and then you know decide one way or the other. And I think it will happen, but uh, we don't know how. So right now. I think people are trying to form a small group where we think uh, using more uh, advanced tools of GIS, et cetera, now to actually identify areas which have not been surveyed, but which seem like potential Malabar civet habitat and do intensive, you know, trapping surveys, et cetera, over there. At the same time, like, like you were also mentioning, trying and getting some DNA, you know, 
proper DNA analysis done by using the best tools we have today. And uh, so after that, I think we will either give up. <laughs> no, I, I think if, if you do not find it, I think people will give up on the idea. Yeah. But even declaring it as extinct seems to be like perpetrating uh, and that era. the species existed. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. seem to be the best yeah. solution to this conundrum. Correct. But then if this, uh, like the field service will say it is extinct, whereas like if we do manage to extract good DNA and if all the people who have specimens or, or samples of Malabar civet and large spotted civet allow people to actually access them and do a detailed analysis, I think we will be able to then say, okay, the species did not exist in the first place and we really you know, spent a lot of time and energy trying to find it. But that's okay, I think. It's better to be thorough. True. Thank you so much, <laughs> Divya. That was very fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Now you brought back Malabar civet into my thought and I'm like, okay, what should I do next? <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to launch into the definitive solution to the problem no no, no I, I don't know no probably not i will i will just i think i i i still very strongly believe that it's not a valid species <laughs> okay all right thank you so much divya welcome yeah